Welcome back to the Skits and Giggles podcast. I am Pascal, chief instigator of this show and your host. I'm joined by my co-host and our resident engineer, the ying to my yang, the reach to my stack. Bryson, how's it going today, buddy? Going great, Pascal. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, man. Um, today, we are joined by the man behind Vein Bicycles, Robert Janssen. Robert, welcome to the Skits and Giggles podcast. How's it going today? Uh, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for doing this in English. It really means a lot to us. Before we get to our conversation, let's briefly do our spiel with the social and where you guys can find more information about the Skits and Giggles podcast. We're currently most active on our Instagram, where you can skid right into our DMs and follow along at Skits and Giggles. And you can find our website with all the relevant links and info under the URL skitsandgiggles.com. Also, if you guys like what we're doing and want to know what's up, just give us a follow on Spotify. Hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to great podcasts. Finally, sharing, your epi sharing our episodes uh, on our socials or a heartfelt five-star rating on your favorite platform goes a long way in helping us reach more people like you. Right on, let's get back to Robert. Robert, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into mountain bikes and what your uh, riding looks like today? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I come really, really late to the mountain bike scene, uh, actually. Uh, I started mountain biking in a serious way about 2014 in the summer. I uh, bought my first fully mountain bike, it was a Kona process, 134, and um, that's where I started. Very nice, a cool bike, and uh, yeah, I think we've, we've, had, uh, we've had quite a few, um, quite a few guests that had their uh, first uh, experiences and, uh, and love, found their love for riding on a Kona. Um, But, uh, so everything was not so great with this uh, mountain bike. And at some stage, um, you thought uh, you needed to, uh, to have your own mountain bikes and start your own bike company. And uh, tell us a little bit about the bike that made you start Vein Bicycles. Um, I was riding this uh, Kona a long time and I changed all the parts, almost everything except the frame. <laughs> so <laughs> at the end... Uh, um, Oh, what I want to say, I'm still riding this bike today, so it's it's not crap or something else. But I brought it quite to the edge, and um, at some point my riding style changed a little bit into more in um, hike and bike. So I, I carry up the bike on the shoulder up to the, to a mountain or uh, crossing a, a pass and um, riding down on the other side of the mountain. And uh, of course, this Kona is not uh, a carbon bike, it is about 16 kilogram weight. And um, myself, I'm only 60 kilogram person, so it's about a, port, a quarter of my own weight to carry up the mountain. And, and I thought it's too heavy. And I start searching for another a new bike, a light one, a flexible one, it's like um, head angle for riding down the mountain, and, but still capable to ride uphill. That's, that was really uh, important. And uh, it should have a kind of aesthetic aspects. It should have been uh, well designed, integrated cables, routes, everything, and uh, a clean look at the end. And um, to find this bike, I, I struggled about two years. <laughs> And then I decided to build one by myself. And um, did you uh, did you have any experience with uh, building bikes, or, or you know, were just starting from scratch? I decided I'm going to build my bike, and off I go. No, I just thought it could not that be complicated. <laughs> no, I started really from the scratch and. Uh, no experience with uh, building a bicycle. I brought some experience to, uh, for material um, uh, specifications. Uh, I, I know how to weld materials of steel and aluminium. So I, I bought also a new welding machine and and every tools I, I had to use to build a bicycle. I just brought it together 
and start building pikes. But now, uh, so yeah, Vein Bascules, um, it's now out in the open. It's been out in the open for a couple of months now, I believe. Um, so what uh, what is the goal or what is your, your vision with, uh, with Vein Bicycles? What, uh, what kind of problem are you looking to solve? Uh, I think it was some, some times back uh, a few years ago, I came to the idea that um, I'm not the only one searching for a bike that fits and a, a lightweight version for uh, riding down a mountain um, with a nice beautiful frame. So I start thinking about other people's, um, for example, uh, tall people's or short people with uh, long arms or short legs. And I think they had much more struggle than me to find a, a perfect bike for them. So why don't help them? What uh, talked to me from the beginning, uh, of course, was the, the very clean design of your, of your frames, which, you know, when I saw the first photos, I was... Very impressed. It was like very looked very sleek, very clean, very well designed, and uh, of course that's only possible because you're using um, kind of novel um, production techniques with 3D printing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? How how did you come to deciding that you know you want to go the 3D printing route? Uh, yeah, there was about three major reasons for the decision to take or to use the 3D printing technology. It's about this integrated cable routing. Uh, that's quite um, possible in, in designing that and on the, on the CAD model and getting it out of the printer. And they are still a little bit complicated with the internals of the frame, but um, at the end, the outside view is quite beautiful. Um, I think the second reason was to um, to move those stress points from uh, welded, welded frames, for example, out of these corners to another position. For example, here I use um, the adhesive bonding at another point and um, I could de-stress the entire frame um, junction. Okay, so yeah, that makes sense, right? So because, of course, when you use uh, aluminium and welding, and then like all the stress is on the um, on the joints or on the you know where the the, the tubes come together, and and with three D printing, um, you can create a more efficient uh, structure in terms of uh, deflecting the different forces. Exactly. And uh, the third reason was because of the the sizing uh, geometry matrix that I have. Uh, developed. Um, there are so many different frame sizes with uh, every frame has a uh, own angles in, in every corner and uh, it creates a, a, a lot of different articles to, to build a, um, a locked frame to that. So the 3D printing was also offering the, the freedom to, to design those parts makes a lot of sense the um of course there's a couple of other uh, brands out in the market uh, today that are using similar techniques um have you um exchanged ideas um with any of those brands or you know had conversations or, or have you done everything on your own uh in the beginning i, I couldn't say that i have exchanged any ideas of course, I have seen other uh, manufacturers using 3D printing technologies and uh, I was in contact with others too, but we haven't discussed about uh, problems or solutions yet. Why did you decide on a, um, a lug construction instead of perhaps making a full top tube 3D printed or like a major half section of the front triangle or two halves? Um, it seems that lug construction is traditionally made from steel lugs, and then you um, you would um, braze steel tubes to them. Uh, so you have kind of the same materials there, and um, you know, like on ro old racing bikes, you know. Um, so what's what's the difference between making a really big three D print and just the lug itself? I think the major topic is uh, to make it cost efficient. 
Of course, you can print the entire bike in a, in a 3D printer and, and put it together after that, but uh, a 3D printing is uh, time consuming and that's what it makes it really expensive. I see. And so the tubes that you use to connect the aluminium lugs are of, made of which material? They're made of uh, stainless steel. So I, I use industrial uh, standard stainless steel, high precision tubes. And uh, instead of the, the famous Columbus or Reynolds tubing, so, um, because I have a wider choice of uh, sizes, so I can really choose from the tenth of mil millimeters in the wall thickness and um, set every calculation, just what I get on the market. I see. Okay. So you also size up the tubes based on the size of the frame as well? Uh, the dimension of the tube itself, not directly. It's just about the length then to, to connect those locks together. And um, do you need to uh, put the lugs through any post-treatment after they're 3D printed? Is there a sanding procedure or something like this bef before you bond them with the stainless steel? Uh, I'm working with the, the 3D printing company, which is heat treating the the 3D printed part after the taking it out of, of the printer and um, this makes all these uh, characteristics uh, much better of the part itself. Okay, so you have a certain amount of precision from them and you're able to uh, basically take that product and with very minimal um, preparation do your fitting and bonding uh, to, to make the complete frame. I have to prepare this parts or the, the connection surfaces uh, just before the, the bonding itself. Uh, that's a part of the procedure and the production of the, the, the frame building itself then. But uh, from the company, it, we also uh, skipped some... Um, how, about, how about this? Um, Robert, can you take us through the procedure to take all the raw materials and set them up into a form of, of a bicycle frame. Like I've, I've seen them do it with welding um, and, I, and I've done my own brazed bicycle, but uh, I haven't seen um, a stainless steel and aluminum 3D printed lug construction. So maybe just uh, briefly walk us through uh, the steps on how to do that. Um, yeah, there are some preparations to do uh, on the 3D printed parts, uh, the surfaces for the boundary, um, have to be cleaned, uh, grinded, and cleaned again just for preparation for the for the adhesive. Um, the same with the tubing; um, they need to be cut and bent, and also grinded, cleaned, and grinded again to just to have this uh, good surface for the adhesive to give a, a, a strength uh, boundary at the end. And um, after the adhesive is applied, um, I do some heat treatment, uh, but the low temperature heat treatment to the to the entire frame just to harden out the, the adhesive itself. And what temperature are we talking about? Like uh, sixty degrees Celsius? It's about sixty-five degrees. Okay. So for two hours, sixty-five degrees. I see. So just to accelerate the curing of the of the adhesive. So once the adhesive is set and you have your frame in the jig, um, you could basically take it out and build the bike or just doing a minor uh, thread chasing and then head tube um, um, uh, reaming just to get surfaces flat or what's the next step? It's basically just take the frame out of, of the of the holding system and, and then grinding all this uh, over um, spilled um, glue out of the frame and um, after that it's just uh, cleaning it, bringing it to the paint shop and then I will receive it back and doing all this uh, bike components related uh, work like thread cutting in the bottom bracket and um, everything else. Right on. So you're doing a lot of the assembly, or you're doing all of the assembly yourself at your own um, premises and you you 
also um, not only assembling it in Switzerland, you're also having these 3D lugs printed in Switzerland, correct? That's right, yeah. Okay. Also, the stainless steel tubing is coming from a Switzerland uh, producer? Yes, I have a supplier here in Switzerland, but um, they will not produce it here anymore. I think there's no uh, uh, steel production company when in Switzerland based. Okay, that's an interesting. It's an interesting uh, topic, right? Because uh, we've had, uh, you know, quite a few conversation where it is um, sustainability and transparency um, issue has been very, very important. And uh, you know, I think I, I talk for Bryson and myself, and we say that this is something that is very important to us, or increasingly so. Um, is this also something you've thought about uh, when you created your company? Yeah, that's definitely a point. Um, I, I try to avoid uh, high energy consuming uh, um, manufacturing procedures. Um, therefore, I, I don't use um, aluminium uh, frames or tubing and welding it because they need a heat treatment after that. And this is also high energy consumption. And um, of course, the 3D printing is not the best uh, example for low energy consumption uh, procedures, but it, it, it's kind of uh, compromising everything. So um, when we talk about sustainability, if you have to focus at, at each single point and, and check what can you do and this one and what can you make it better. For example, um, steel tubes aren't made anymore in Switzerland, so you have long, um, a long supply chain and you cannot decide to other tubes because there are no options. But you, do you work with your supplier to, to make sure that you know, it's not um, something from Far East in a very, you know, let's say, in air quotes, dirty factory with uh, the most terrible um, human rights track record <laughs> and and all that sort of stuff. So do you know, um, so you, you kind of know from where your supplier is um, um, getting the material for you. So do you kind of know that your supplier is working with like credible, um, credible suppliers himself? Yeah, it's quite difficult from, from a small company's position to, to ask in a supply chain or a supplier um, if, you, if they can do anything for sustainability on your own company. So I, I don't have any um, possibilities to, to, to influence on them. I, for example, on the steel tubes, I, I ask them for about 100 meter of tubes and that for them it's kind of nothing. Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's just a, an interesting notion, right? So because if we, um, if we ask, um, let's say, our economy to change towards a more sustainable and more transparent way of working, then we need to, um, you know, um, be more demanding when it comes to these things. Um, and you know, we have an example. We had a conversation with uh, Phil. Uh, law from Pembury, and then he's obviously um, using aluminium. And uh, of course, there's nothing in the world that will make aluminium uh, a nicer material to get out of the ground and more efficient when it comes to energy consumption. But you know, the, what he's trying to do is just making sure that wherever he gets his aluminium from is uh, you know is a reputable producer, and uh, you know he knows it's from this certain producer in Russia in this case or, or wherever else it is. So, so that's, I think, something that's um, getting quite important. I think uh, maybe I'll just throw it out there. There, there, are, um, there are sellers for uh, different metals that will be able to tell you, um, give you like a, an, an origin paper, basically. It's like a traceability that says, uh, we got it from this factory in whatever China, Taiwan, or wherever around the world. And it will have like a, a stamp and it's, it's for like a lot of material that came in. And in some cases they're able to trace, okay, the, the pipe that we gave you 
came from either this lot or this lot, and these are the two factories that we bought it from, or this is the factory we bought it from, and it has two batch um, pieces of paper that says, you know, with their with their stamp and their signature, and we get it when it arrives here, and then it's it's a sort of traceability, uh, maybe not exactly, but can give you a little bit better picture in case you wanted to inquire. Or some reassurance. Um, yeah, of course, there are some uh, some official uh, declarations for companies to, to state. Um, for example, the, this AORH, AOHS um, declaration, uh, the conformity that they don't use any uh, toxic materials or lubrications in that company. And uh, the REACH conformity is also one part of it. And uh, all the suppliers are fulfilling that at the moment. So, but that's the, those minimum requirements that we can um, ask for as a, as a small company or brand or whatever. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I think it's good. Uh, and, and uh, you know, something you should also be pushing for even as a small company and I like what you're doing of course I mean the the notion of um, um, you know using more efficient um, production techniques like uh, 3d printing is of course already a first step in the right direction right because yes it's not energy efficient but it's very efficient with the material because you know you basically have the printer and the, the powder and you know whatever powder you're not using you can use it for something else there's not much uh, leftover <laughs> um, so that's uh, you know, already a, a good step um, maybe um, one thing so what, right now um, what does your um, your model your model uh, list look like so right now you only have one hardtail is there anything else planned uh, I got a couple of ideas and uh, also different techniques to to realize that ideas but um, what I learned the last three years in developing one bike is do it one by one. <laughs> and um, now I'm finishing the, this mountain bike, hardtail mountain bike. Um, a great, a big idea I want to follow up in the, in the near future is a, a fully mountain bike. But uh, maybe I have to prioritize the gravel bike first. For sure. The market, the market demands... That's, that's right, the market demands, and then and when you start um, building up a company, you have to listen to the market a little bit and, and not doing your own stuff. Uh, otherwise, you, you lost your money in, in a second. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you, can't, you can't beat the market, so. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, uh, you know, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting segment in Switzerland in particular, um, you know. I think uh, I'm, I uh, I treated myself to a custom road bike. Um, what is it now? Eight years ago, and uh, if I had the foresight to, to know what uh, what uh, ri um, cycling looks like in 2020 or you know even 2018 or whatever, then I would have gone. Wouldn't have gone for a full-on road bike. I would have gone for for yeah, so kind of an all-road or something. Like just because here in Switzerland, uh, yes, the roads are fantastic and, uh, you know, traffic is safe and, and all that. But, I mean, you have just so many more possibilities with, you know, forest roads and mountain service roads and, and all that sort of stuff. It's just, uh, yeah. So, of course, like the cross-section between a mountain bike and, and the road bike, but, you know, it doesn't need to tick all the boxes of a mountain bike and it doesn't need to tick all the boxes of a road bike so I think it's a very interesting uh, very interesting segment at the minute although of course the cynical the cynical view is that uh, now that they start putting flat handlebars on it it's becoming uh, mountain bikes from the 90s <laughs> and in terms of vein cycling technology um, your next models will they also be using the 3D printed lug construction um, yes, I will think so because I try to um, apply this uh, geometry matrix also on the gravel bike to, to give a, a rider the full choice what size he want to ride and what length, one height. Maybe in a different way, not in a 30 
different sizes, maybe a little bit short of 20 or something. I was still working on that. Okay, that's a that's a very good very good uh, transition and a segue to I think uh, the other standout feature of uh, Vane bicycles. That's of course your uh, your geometry matrix and uh, you know the, the thirty different uh, sizes that you offer for your mountain bike frame. Um, of course, uh, Bryson and myself we are a little bit of a geometry dorks when it comes to bikes, so we're, this is something something that we are very interested in. Um, so uh, can you? Uh, can you talk us through what is the what is the idea with your geometry matrix? What are the basic principles? The idea is uh, to have the the rider as a the fixed position or the fixed point on on a bicycle system. When you see the the bike and the rider as a system, and um, the the sizes goes from from very very small bikes to quite big bikes to to cover all these um, different people in the world. Um, the focus on that is mainly on three measures on the body. It's the inner leg height, the, the arm length and the shoulder height. And I use a simple calculation uh, formulas that are existing since maybe 20, 30 years, 40 years or longer. So that's nothing new. But um, to, to use these formulas and put it into a matrix to, to cover all these people, or the most of them, I think it's about 98% of all people can choose a, a bike that fits quite well. Um, that was one of those, I uh, think, uh, unique ideas, yeah. You know, it's great. And um, in terms of uh, your production technique, it's, of course... Uh you know, opens up a lot of different uh, combinations, but uh, you know, I think that's obvious. But uh, the what are the the challenges of offering so many sizes? Before we get into more what the the matrix is, I think the challenging thing is that I cannot take anything on stock. So I I produce on order. If if anybody uh, places an order, I just check out the CAD data, send it to the to the 3D printing company and go get those parts um, after 10 days, for example, uh, finished and ready to, to build up the frame. But it also promises that uh, I can produce frame in a four to five weeks completely with uh, the paint job. And uh, in this age, with the corona situation of supply chain from Asia, I think that's quite a good position in the market. So we have a rider-centric geometry. And it's basically, as you said, it's, it's a formula that's it's well known and it's been used before. And it makes a lot of sense. Of course, you want the rider to be in an optimal position for power transfer to the pedals, uh, for comfort and for yeah agility to maneuver the bike. Um, that would suggest that the the geometry, or at least the seating position that's chosen, is designed for pedaling and not so much for maybe jumping um, or you know maybe kind of a a more progressive stance in in the the hardtail category like these these extra slack um, super low bottom bracket style uh, bicycles that we're seeing these days. Are we looking at a bike that's like kind of a, a trail cross country or like how would you describe um right now you have a you have a e2 that's your size how would you describe the the style of riding that this bicycle is designed for um yeah it's kind of cross country style bike and but it has the capabilities to ride single trails really steep single trails and um, this makes really fun i think so uh, I, I went to the mountains uh, Saturday two weeks before, and the weather was quite good still. And um, the the steep single tracks makes really fun on it. Okay, so you still have a, a quite a bit of ability to tackle uh, extreme terrain, um, but while still having a, a pedal ability, uh, a platform, uh, a factor that allows you to stay in a good pedaling. Um, stance, let's say. I see. 
So a 30 size matrix is not seen so common in the industry and for a good reason. It'd probably be really difficult for a lot of manufacturers to do so, at least the bigger ones. Um, how are you able to manage uh, deciding on 30 different sizes? So you have three reaches, is that correct? Um, yeah, I have uh, a 10 frame heights with each of them has a three reach sizes. Yeah. And I think with the because I'm a small, very, very, very small company, I got this flexibility to produce every frame uh, on demand and not like the, the big manufacturers that are pre-ordering frames for a complete season or complete production batch. And uh, so I'm, I got this flexibility to create 30 different sizes. Okay, and then how do they, how do they differ? So you say you got three different reaches and 10 different heights, but um, how do you decide between, um, you know, for which arm length and which body height uh, is which which combination is the right one? Is that just a simple extrapolation? So kind of scaling from a base measurement or preference? Or have you done any testing? I've done uh, testings on, on two different sizes and um, all other sizes are kind of uh, theoretic calculations. But those calculations are, are based on, on the common formulas and um, for those entire um, spectrum of those uh, sizes, I've used the uh, statistics from, uh, from the body measurements and I just transferred that in, into a matrix. What I did additionally to this um, spectrum of sizes, I, I put a amount of a correction on a personal feeling. So after these testings, I corrected those formulas a little bit and I also uh, put a little bit on the market um, on feedback into this formula. So when you have a precise eye, you can see that uh, the biggest frames are not in stepping that far with the reach, so they have a shorter reach extension on the three, three different um, um, reach sizes than per height. On the same on, on the on the smaller frames, I, I did some um, some uh, modification in, in the formula. Okay, and um, were you kind of benchmarking your sizes against uh, anything else that was out in the market, or and what kind what kind of bikes? Sure, that was one of the very first steps. Overall, I I checked about. Um, 20, 30, maybe, yeah, about that. Manufacturers with their hardtail cross country style bikes check out that geometry, um, put it all into a table, a data sheet, and, and think about it just to, to see it in the line. <laughs> but one thing you do that uh, a lot of manufacturers don't do, especially on hardtails, is you have like a side specific. Chainstays. Well, maybe not size specific, but you have different lengths of chainstay. How did that work out? It's because I see the the rider as uh, the the fixed point on a bike, and um, as bigger the rider is is go, or as, as bigger as the rider is, um, the the position of the back wheel will also move a little bit, and uh, the angle of the seat tube is changing too so that requires a different um, sizing on the chainstay and also the rear triangle i guess one um, nice characteristic is on the smaller sizes it's um, catered towards a 27 and a half inch wheel and in the larger sizes you go to a 29 and uh, I did a little um, configurator for myself, which I found on your website. And I came to the, um, the, the, the end where it says, I'm either a C3 or a D3. And so when I looked further into the geometry to see which one I would prefer, um, it came down to this wheel size. So the C3 is the, the largest size that has a 27.5 wheel. And then a D3 would have a 29. And I guess, you know, for someone like me, I could be in this 
um, person who said, no, I'm, I love 27.5 wheels. I love their agility or maybe I'm, I favor them for my standover and nothing else. Or I could be the guy who says, yeah, it's, it's all about the rollover. I want the 29. Um, I'm all about that 29 style and that's the go-to for me. So I'm, I'm going to size up to a D3. It's going to give me more stability and that's just how I feel about it. So I'm one of those people who, f- who fall in there who are a little bit maybe lucky to choose. Uh, it's, it's maybe luck for you, but it, it was a really hard decision for me because uh, I designed the bike as a 29-inch uh, cross-country wheeling bike. And um, But when you consider small people on a 29-inch wheel bike, then you, you must do something. <laughs> oh, for sure. And uh, and also, of course, at this this uh, juncture at the, of the bike industry, we now start uh, using mixed wheel sizes. And of course, Bryson, he's already alluded to it with being right between the 29er and the 27 and a half uh, sizes on the hardtail. That's why uh, you know, in the in the real world, he's currently riding a mullet bike with a 27 and a half in the rear and a 29 in the front. Um, I mean, it, it's 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 funny because uh, I was just uh, on the weekend. I was at um, the uh, the Swiss Enduro Championships, and uh, there was a uh, there's actually quite a quite a number now of people that are running uh, mullet sizes on trail bikes, race bikes, even some cross country bikes. You start seeing it, and uh, you know, it's it just gives more more people the option to find the right size for them and the right balance of the bike and uh, i think but for a producer it's uh, it's obviously even more difficult to to get the right geometry and the right you know feel of the bike that uh, you know that, that then the riders will like yeah in fact when you put a 27.5 wheel in a bag on a 29 inch bike then you will change the entire geometry so you've got a slacker head tube angle, a slacker seat tube angle, the bottom bracket uh, lowers down a little bit, and I think that changes the entire feeling of the bike. And some do that on purpose, and but I think manufacturers are not calculating to that. But um, of course, you know, you said uh, 30 sizes and that you basically manufacture to order. Um, then, of course, the follow-on question to that is, uh, what is stopping you from going full custom? Are you going to also offer people to look at your sizing geometry chart and say, well, for me, example, for, for example, I, I used the, the size selector and I would fall in a G1. I looked at the, at the geometry for a G1 and then I saw I go for 53 reach. And that's kind of like three, three to four centimeters short to what I normally ride, what kind of where I've settled in terms of my preference. Uh, I've gone much longer than that. I've gone much shorter than that. Uh, but kind of the 480 neighborhood with a five centimeter or 50 millimeter uh, stem is kind of uh, my, my happy place. Um, of course, and I saw bottom bracket drop and it's like mm, a bit lower would probably be nice. And a chain stay probably a bit longer would be nice. <laughs> so... So are you thinking of offering like the full custom experience if clients uh, request that? Um, yeah, that's, that's the key word you said. It's, it's more the preferences of the, of the customer. Uh, if you want to have a, a full custom bike, then it requires more than three dimensions of the body. Then you need those um, adjustment bike where you can move any part of the bike to just fit to your body and, and for that I'm totally not prepared but I can come together to the customer with uh, preferences to, to check with what's possible to, to change on the drawings or on the, on the bike itself but let's say if I, if I come to you with uh, my preferred measurements uh, of, of what I would like, then would, it, would, you, would you say like, oh, that's, I mean, it's not like crazy adjustments. Let's say, you know, a couple of millimeters here, maybe a degree or two there. Is that completely overthrowing your approach or is that something you can accommodate that you can work with? 
I think it's if it's only a couple of millimeters, then it depends on the position of the frame where the millimeters have to be removed or or, or added. Um, I think that's that's no point of discussion. I can, or we can talk about that. No problem. It would be a fun experiment. But uh, yeah, so I mean, um, it's obviously one one question with uh, with geometry. Uh, if we if we look at the last uh, few years, um, the the mountain bike geometry has kind of finally finally left the dark ages of uh, road bike uh, geometry, where it came from in the eighties and nineties. Um, it's gone a bit. Some say it's gone a bit too far. Um, in terms of the length and the slackness and how low it is and all that sort of stuff, um, what is your view on uh, on like the you know the the mountain bike geometry of the future? Where do you think it will settle? I think they will find a sweet spot somewhere because at the moment it's like pushing boundaries. The bike parks getting faster, the tracks getting faster, so you need a faster bike. You had a slacker head angle. Um, of course, such bikes you cannot use anymore on, on um, steep and narrow single tracks. But uh, there are other type of bikes and geometries for that. So I think um, the trend is still ongoing. Faster bikes, racing machines, and, and somewhere maybe in five or in ten years it will slow down a little bit with the changes. Uh, but I'm not sure if they will move back. Maybe there is some, some revival of old geometries, but I don't think they will move back then. Robert, what's the what's the story behind vein cycling technology? Why did you choose vein as a word? I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a, a villain from Batman, but obviously uh, we're, we're, we're talking bicycles here. But there's not a big story behind that. Um, it's more a little bit awkward. It was my nickname in the mid of 2000s. So everybody was calling me Wayne, and, and I answered Wayne Interest, Wayne Interessiert, Wayne ah. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. German wordplay. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love it. <laughs> so it was a vein bicycle for, for um, kind of a beginner, um, an expert. Uh, where does it fall for... The consumer. Um, I think it's more for the for the advanced people. They have already done those experience on their first and the second bike, and now searching for a bike that fit more to the bodies and and goes more into customized bikes. And so I think that's those people I, I'm asking to to buy my bikes. All right, and I noticed uh, on the. Um seat tube, top tube, uh, seat stay junction, you have on there also embossed uh, number one. Is it possible, like, if I were to sign up to get my name there instead? Can you 3D print my name on that lug instead? Sure. Um, uh, on my bike, I have written Robert. Oh, rad. Depends on the amount of letters, but it's still possible. So the story of Vane Cycles is, um, is a pretty interesting one. We have... The uh, the standout thirty size matrix of, for bicycles in in, in the lineup. Um, there's this um, adhesive uh, bonding technique to these three D printed lugs uh, out of aluminium, um, which look fantastic. And of course, you can have them customized with your name on them. Um, has there been any uh, I- industry um, interest? Uh, maybe a manufacturer. Or a design firm who's contacted you, contacted you to maybe lease your your design or your 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 production technique. Not directly in this way, but um, I thought three weeks ago I have submitted to the German Design Award in in Frankfurt. So I, I submitted the project number one with all this uh, geometry and uh, the design itself. And um, those good news is that. Um, they have nominated me for that. Oh, wow. So cool. I'm really stoked about it. Yeah. So which organization is this? It's, it's from the German Design Council. That's a kind of organization in Germany for most famous designs. And they got a couple of categories. And uh, I submitted in the category 
excellent product design, bicycle and bikes. Well, on that bombshell, on that closer, we are we're getting a little, we're getting towards the end of our time here. So uh, we just want to wrap it up with our uh, with our closer class questions, if that's okay. I think we heard a little bit about uh, that first bike that got you really stoked on riding. So can you talk us uh, maybe let, talk about talk us through the the color of your Kona process mm-hmm. one two one three four. The color is black and gold. Fast. That's very fast. And it, I changed almost everything. I changed those nuts on the chain ring into gold. I, I put some gold braided cable routings and I very nice. expressed myself very cool. back into 17. Very cool. <laughs> Fully pet. All right. Well, then, um, you know, imagine you are um, Harry Skidini and you're a bike magician extraordinaire. Um, you can make riding a bike more awesome for anyone by the stroke of a magic dropper post. What would you do? I will found a company <laughs> to build specific bikes for people with specific So everyone needs. can find the right size. <laughs> genius. Groundbreaking That's ideas. Genius. <laughs> you, should, you should think about that. <laughs> Someone needs to follow that up. <laughs> so taking the vein number one out for a ride... Um, you mentioned uh, a little bit of a hike a bike, so we're getting up to some rocky pass. Of course, uh, in Switzerland, you're going to encounter a lot of hikers, but uh, they're egging you on. They're telling you, hey, do a skid, do a backflip. Okay, maybe not a backflip. Do a skid. How do you, how do you show off? I like those uh, Scandinavian flicks from the rally. Enough said. That's, that's my skid, I think. But it, it makes most fun on road bikes. And wet streets. And wet streets. And high speed. All right. Full adrenaline. Yeah. All right. Well, Robert, thanks again for your time and for sitting down with us tonight. That was really, really cool. Um, if uh, listeners have uh, any questions, um, you know, want to learn more about you and Vane Bicycles, um, where can they find you? Um, I'm present in, in the internet, yeah, the glory internet um, at wainbicycles.com. Uh, that's the homepage. There's also a possibility to um, submit to newsletter. And I try to post a lot of stuff on Instagram. But yeah, we all I do. almost fail about that. So maybe every one or two weeks there's a new post. Well, again, thank you very much. That was really cool. Bryson, thanks for your time too. And uh, I hope to see you uh, out on Cheers the trails one time soon. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Dude.